We all know Cleopatra. She's been portrayed in the movie, and this movie, and this movie. She's probably the most famous queen ever. Sorry, Elizabeth. She moved empires. She was a powerhouse of a woman, the last Egyptian pharaoh. There's been so much written about her over the centuries and millennia that not even ChatGPT can sift through the internet and separate the truth from fiction. But it's fun to look back on history and see how these stories came to be. And when it comes to the history of Cleopatra, there were a lot of stories. Let's go dumpster diving and pull out some gems about Egypt's most famous queen and see how true to life they actually are. Number 1. She liked to party Cleopatra is probably most famous as a seductress, a symbol of temptation, a queen who made Julius Caesar and Mark Antony weak enough in the knees that they nearly gave a big middle finger to Rome and declared themselves Egyptian. And a big part of that seduction revolved around extravagant parties. Oh, yeah. In 41 BC, Cleopatra took a trip to Tarsus to meet Mark Antony. She took the trip in a grandiose, perfume-scented yacht, according to the Greek historian Plutarch. She fashioned herself as a goddess. She had all the bells and whistles on board, and for Antony, it was game, set, match. He needed her money for his various military campaigns into the Middle East at the time, which is why he requested that she make the journey from Alexandria up to Tarsus, a city on the southern coast of modern-day Turkey. Antony was so smitten that he ended up going back down to Alexandria with Cleopatra, and they spent their time in the city having all kinds of fun. They started what can basically only be described as a party club. They called it the Society of Inimitable Livers. For those of you who didn't major in unnecessarily complicated English, inimitable means so very great that there's no way it could ever be copied. They were basically bragging about how immune their livers were to excessive amounts of alcohol. Number 2. History's Most Expensive Cocktail and maybe the cherry on the top of Antony and Cleopatra's whole Bacchanalian relationship might have come about because of a dare. The couple loved to play flirtatious games with each other. They would roam around Alexandria and place bets on who could break into the most tombs of the ancient pharaohs. They were actually responsible for the entire Egyptian hieroglyphic system, which is basically just pictures of weird dreams that Antony and Cleopatra had before waking up together in rumpled sheets that smelled like all the perfume ever made. Not true, but imagine an entire rewrite of a civilization after realizing its manuscripts were just teenage-style love letters that were pasted over actual historical information. Where were we? Right, parties. The cherry on the top of Antony and Cleopatra's love of partying might have come at an elaborate dinner they had one night. Cleopatra joked with Antony that she'd throw him the most expensive dinner his stomach had ever known. They ate a normal dinner. Antony wasn't impressed. He looked at her skeptically, thinking that maybe she had lost her mind. He had more extravagant dinners in tents outside of war zones. But then Cleopatra motioned to a maid who brought her a glass filled of some kind of vinegar. She took one of her massive pearl earrings off, plunked it into the glass, waited for the pearl to dissolve, and then drank it. The pearl was worth over 25 million of today's dollars. It was maybe the most expensive cocktail ever. Number 3. She wrote a book? Cleopatra might have partied hard, but she worked hard too, and she studied a lot. Growing up, she had full access to the Library of Alexandria, one of the largest in the ancient world. She was fluent in several languages, including her native Egyptian, Greek, which was the language of the ruling elite in Egypt at the time, and Latin, the language of the Roman Empire. She could also speak Aramaic, the language of the Persian Empire. Cleopatra's ability to speak multiple languages was a key asset in her diplomatic and political dealings with foreign leaders. It allowed her to communicate effectively with ambassadors and envoys from different regions and cultures. Cleo was also a gifted orator and was able to use her linguistic skills to persuade and negotiate with those around her, which came in handy for someone trying to expand her empire. She was apparently particularly interested in science and medicine, and there are rumors circling the internet that she wrote a book on cosmetics, a fact that would seem to make sense given her iconic love of makeup and perfume. However, that book was most likely written by another Cleopatra, a 
the mysterious and little-known woman they call Cleopatra the Physician. It's thought that she wrote cosmetics sometime after 64 BCE because it mentions a weight system that wasn't used before then. Number 4. Cleopatra the Goddess If you want to command the attention of an entire empire, it could help if the people think you're a goddess. And during her reign, Cleopatra very much played up to the whole goddess angle. While Cleopatra wasn't considered to be the actual embodiment of the goddess Isis, she came pretty close. And she did use the cult of Isis to pump up her political and religious authority in Egypt. Isis was a popular goddess in ancient Egypt, and her cult had spread throughout the Mediterranean by the time Cleopatra took the throne. The goddess was associated with motherhood, fertility, and the natural world, and she was revered as a powerful and benevolent deity. Cleopatra, who was of Greek and Macedonian descent, recognized the importance of the Egyptian religious traditions and figured she'd cozy up to Isis to legitimize her rule. She stylized herself as the living embodiment of the goddess and portrayed herself in artistic depictions of Isis with her child, Horus, reinforcing the idea of her maternal power. Cleo also built a bunch of temples dedicated to Isis, and she sponsored lavish festivals and ceremonies in honor of the goddess. By aligning herself with the powerful and popular cult of Isis, Cleopatra was able to solidify her position as the leader of Egypt and gain the support of her subjects. Cleopatra in Judea History texts devote a lot of space to Cleopatra's liaisons with Caesar and Antony, her passing and her everlasting conflict with the Roman Empire. But something that doesn't get so much press was her relationship with the Kingdom of Judea in modern-day Israel. Cleopatra had a few run-ins with Judea during her reign. In 47 BC, she travelled to Judea to meet with Julius Caesar, who was visiting the region at the time. She was accompanied by her brother and co-ruler Ptolemy XIV and a whole host of officials and Egyptian soldiers. During her visit, Cleopatra may have attempted to intervene in the ongoing conflict between Herod the Great and his rivals for the throne of Judea. Herod had been appointed as the Roman client King of Judea by Caesar and he may have seen Cleopatra's visit as a threat to his position. As a Ptolemy, Cleopatra thought she had a claim to the territories in Judea, and over the years she tried her best to undermine the leadership there so she could take what pieces she could. In 41 BC, Cleopatra again became involved in Judean affairs when Herod sought her help in regaining his throne. He'd been deposed by the Parthians, who had invaded Judea and installed Antigonus, a rival claimant to the throne and the new king. Herod fled to Egypt, where he appealed to Cleopatra for support. At first, Cleopatra agreed to help Herod, but she had her own political problems. She was caught up in a power struggle with her brother-husband Ptolemy XIV, who she would eventually poison, allegedly. Herod eventually secured Roman support and was able to retake his throne with the help of Roman troops and Octavian, Antony's bitter rival. But Herod probably felt pretty slighted by Cleo. He reportedly made plans to have her assassinated, but his advisors smartly told him it was a bad idea. Number 6. Buzz Buzz It's no secret that the Egyptians were hip to a lot of the more pleasurable experiences in life. They used quite a few intimate devices and oils in the bedroom, and also had a sleuth of birth control methods, one of which was alligator feces. According to one story, Cleopatra also used animal products in the bedroom. Well, animals, actually. It said she was out for a stroll one day and saw a beehive. It was buzzing and vibrating, and she had an idea. Why not harness the mighty power of these insects to help out when Julius Caesar and Mark Antony were away, and she was all alone at night? She asks one of her top engineers to build her a little box, or gourd, with walls that bees can shake to produce vibration. This device would also prevent the bees from escaping. The chances are, such an incident would only end in pain. So, there you go. Cleopatra, the mighty queen of Egypt, polyglot fluent in many languages, mover and shaker of empires, seducer of kings, also invented, well, you know. Except, she probably didn't. The story doesn't really have anything to back it up with. Unfortunately, Cleopatra's bee box is probably an urban legend. But who knows? Maybe some archaeologist will dig up some evidence to prove the skeptics wrong. Number 7. Faking her death The story of Cleopatra's death 
is a well-known one, but it's so darn good that it bears repeating, but with a possible twist that doesn't get so much attention. It was 30 BC. Antony and Cleopatra had lost their war with Octavian, Antony's brother-in-law with whom he'd had a pretty catastrophic falling out. Octavian would soon become Augustus Caesar, the first emperor of Rome. Octavian had marched into Alexandria and had Cleopatra and Antony prisoners in their own city, but they were holed up in different places. At some point, Antony received a letter notifying him that the love of his life was dead. Heartbroken and defeated, Antony ran himself through with his own sword. She wasn't dead though, not yet anyway. Antony, bloody and dying, was carried over to Cleopatra's room where he took his last breath in her arms. Shortly after, Cleopatra also took her own life. Some say she did by sneaking an asp into her room and letting it bite her. Others say it was simply a vial of poison. Either way, the last pharaoh of Egypt took her own life instead of being taken back to Rome by Octavian and paraded around in something called a triumph, which was basically a walk of shame for rulers who had been defeated. But the twist? It's possible that Cleopatra faked her own death on purpose so Antony would end his own life. Cleopatra was reportedly negotiating with Octavian and was trying to convince him to give her children a break and let them live. She figured Antony was a lost cause and wanted him out of the picture, but when she saw him bloody and dying, she instantly regretted the decision. Like a lot of stories of Cleopatra, this version of things is up for debate. But if it's true, it would cast a much more sinister light on the love affair between Cleo and Antony. Number 8. Donkey Milk Baths Who doesn't love a good relaxing bath? It helps melt away stress after a difficult day. Maybe light some candles, throw in some bubbles and some donkey milk? It's said that Cleopatra was known to take baths in donkey milk, which was considered a luxury item in ancient times. We're not exactly sure whether she did this or not because there's not much historical evidence to confirm it, and it's entirely possible that the story has been exaggerated or mythologized over time. But according to the ancient Roman historian Pliny the Elder, Cleopatra was known for her beauty and was said to have taken baths in the stuff, which was believed to have skin-soothing and nourishing properties. The practice was said to involve filling a bath with fresh donkey milk and soaking in it for hours. Donkey milk was highly prized in ancient times for its purported health benefits, and it was used in a variety of cosmetic and medicinal preparations. It is possible that Cleopatra, as a wealthy and powerful ruler, may have had access to this rare, expensive and weird product, and may have used it as part of her beauty regime. Got milk? Number 9. No Brotherly Love History is full of examples of sibling rivalries that turn deadly, but Cleopatra's family relationships might have been the deadliest of all. Cleopatra had several siblings, including a younger brother named Ptolemy XIII, with whom she famously engaged in a power struggle for control of Egypt. According to historical accounts, Ptolemy XIII became co-ruler with Cleopatra at a young age after their father's death and their relationship quickly deteriorated into conflict. In 48 BC, Ptolemy XIII's advisors, who were opposed to Cleopatra's rule, instigated a rebellion against her, and she was forced to flee Egypt. During her absence, Ptolemy XIII assumed full control of the kingdom and declared Cleopatra an enemy of the state. When Cleopatra returned to Egypt with an army, backed by her soon-to-be baby daddy, Julius Caesar, she engaged in a civil war with Ptolemy XIII's forces. The conflict ended with Ptolemy XIII's death in battle. Some accounts say he drowned in the Nile after attempting to flee Cleopatra's forces. In the end, Cleopatra was able to secure her position as sole ruler of Egypt. Then there was Ptolemy XIV. This Ptolemy was Cleopatra's youngest brother and co-ruler after she offered the 13th and it is believed that he was initially placed on the throne by Cleopatra as a figurehead, while she ruled as the true power behind the throne. However, as he grew older, Ptolemy XIV may have become a potential threat to Cleopatra's rule, and there were rumors that she had him poisoned. These rumors may have been spread by Cleopatra's enemies in an attempt to discredit her, or they may have been a result of the political intrigue and violence that was common in ancient Egypt. Number 10. No sisterly love. Then there were Cleopatra's sisters. Like her brother, they didn't have a good go of it. One of her sisters, Berenice IV, became the Queen of Egypt while her and Cleopatra's father were in exile between 55 and 58 BC. 
Ptolemy XII was kicked out of Egypt because of the economic mismanagement we were just talking about, but he came back to Alexandria in 58 BC, kicked out his daughter Berenice, and eventually had her executed. Then there's Cleopatra's other sister, Arsinoi. She was Cleopatra's younger sister and a rival for the throne of Egypt. After Cleopatra and her brother husband Ptolemy the 14th became co-rulers of Egypt, Arsinoi was set to live in exile in Ephesus, a city near present-day Turkey. However, she later returned to Egypt with the support of Roman forces led by Julius Caesar's rival, Pompey. During the ensuing civil war, Arsinoi and her forces were defeated by Cleopatra and her ally-slash-lover Julius Caesar. Arsinoi was captured and brought to Rome as a prisoner, but Caesar ultimately spared her life and allowed her to live in exile in the city. Later, when Cleopatra's relationship with Caesar soured and she aligned herself with Caesar's rival Mark Antony, Arsinoi saw an opportunity to regain her position of power in Egypt. She joined forces with the Roman general Gaius Cassius Longinus and began raising an army to challenge Cleopatra's rule. However, her rebellion was short-lived as she was defeated by Caesarion, Cleo and Caesar's son, and executed on the orders of Cleopatra and Mark Antony. The exact circumstances surrounding Arsinoe's death are unclear, but it is believed that she was strangled or beheaded on the orders of Antony and Cleopatra, the new power couple of Alexandria. Number 11. Money Matters When Cleopatra took the throne, she inherited a mess from her father. He'd borrowed a ton of money from Rome and other foreign empires to support his extravagant lifestyle and often ill-advised military campaigns. Egypt was in debt, its currency was garbage, and things weren't looking good. But Cleopatra helped turn the Egyptian economy around. She made a few very important reforms to the monetary system of Egypt, which helped to stabilize the economy and promote trade and commerce. One of the most significant reforms was the introduction of a new standard coinage system, which replaced the chaotic and unreliable currency that had been in use in Egypt for many years under her father. Cleopatra's new coinage system was based on the Roman system and consisted of gold, silver and bronze coins, standardized weights and values. Cleopatra also took steps to control inflation and stabilize the value of the currency by limiting the amount of coins in circulation and ensuring that they were of high quality with uniform weight. She also imposed strict penalties for counterfeiting, which helped to deter fraud and maintain public trust in the monetary system. She also boosted trade and commerce by establishing new trade routes and supporting the growth of the Egyptian economy. She encouraged foreign merchants and traders to come to Egypt by offering incentives like tax exemptions and reduced tariffs. Cleopatra quite literally made Egypt great again, and she could live her own lavish lifestyle knowing full well that she could afford to. Number 12. Her father loved music. A big reason that Cleopatra inherited a mess of an empire when she took the throne was because her father was a bit of a mess. We've already mentioned how he basically tanked the Egyptian economy. In addition to leaving Cleo an empire that was heavily in debt, he also left an empire with an infrastructure that was falling apart. Roads were horrible, irrigation systems needed repair, and as a result, agriculture was less productive. Maybe Cleopatra's dad should have been more interested in ruling a kingdom instead of what he was really interested in, throwing parties and playing music. Ptolemy XII was known as Ptolemy Olets, which means Ptolemy the Flautist. He apparently loved playing the flute and dancing at festivals, celebrating the god Dionysus. On the other hand, Cleopatra herself loved a good rager and managed to do great things for Egypt at the same time. So maybe Ptolemy the Flautist was just bad at multitasking. Number 13. Cleopatra the Beautiful? They say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and beauty standards have varied dramatically over the centuries. Cleopatra is often depicted as a stunning seductress by historians. The Roman historian Cassius Dio described her as a woman of surpassing beauty. The Greek philosopher Plutarch described her as having a most delicious voice and an irresistible charm. But in reality, we don't know what she looked like, other than some sculptures made long after her death. However, there are some examples of artwork that might have been made around the time she was alive. This one, called the Berlin Cleopatra, might be the most accurate. It was discovered in Egypt in 1913, and it quite possibly was carved during her lifetime. But still, we really don't know what she looked like, 
Imagine people 2,000 years in the future finding this sculpture of Cristiano Ronaldo and assuming his looks based on that. Incredible. <laughs> Bad art is possible in any century and millennium. There's also speculation that Cleopatra was red-headed, based on some posthumous portraits of people who may or may not be her. Number 14. Lost Tomb With all the pomp and circumstance surrounding the famous deaths of Antony and Cleopatra, we still don't know where the ancient power couple wound up being buried. The location of Cleopatra's tomb remains a mystery and has been the subject of a ton of speculation and research over the centuries. Despite numerous efforts to locate the tomb, it has never been definitely found, and its whereabouts remain unknown. There are many theories and rumors about the possible location of Cleopatra's tomb, but none have been proven. Some believe that her tomb may be located in the Royal Necropolis at Taposiris Magna, a temple complex about 45 kilometers west of Alexandria. Excavations at the site have uncovered a number of artifacts and inscriptions related to Cleopatra and her family, suggesting that it was an important site during their reign. Others have suggested that Cleopatra may have been buried in a different location, such as a secret tomb or a temple dedicated to the goddess Isis, whom she worshipped and, as we've mentioned, was a goddess she'd like to identify herself with. Some have even speculated that her tomb may have been located in Rome, with rumors circulating that she actually died there instead of Alexandria. Despite the many efforts to locate Cleopatra's tomb, it remains one of the great unsolved mysteries of ancient history. Number 15. Not Egyptian? We mentioned it earlier, but it bears repeating. Cleopatra wasn't actually Egyptian. Her family, the Ptolemies, were a long line of Greek Macedonians who ruled Egypt for 250 years after Alexander the Great conquered the kingdom back in 332 BC. Yet, even though people like to say that Cleopatra wasn't really Egyptian, it's kind of like saying someone whose Italian great-grandparents migrated to the US isn't really American. She was certainly Egyptian. She knew the language. She worshipped and built temples to Egyptian gods. But she and many of the Ptolemaic rulers did so with a distinct fusion of Greek and Egyptian cultures. Greek ancestry may have influenced Cleopatra's foreign policy and political choices. She had an education in Greek philosophy, language and culture, just like her forebearers, and she remained quite close to Greece and other Hellenistic kingdoms during her rule. She also absorbed Greek traditions, including attire, which contributed to her self-identification as a Hellenistic monarch. Cleopatra received a Greek education, and as we mentioned before, she was deeply interested in philosophy and the sciences. She also used her knowledge of Greek language and culture to her advantage in her diplomatic efforts, using her charm and intelligence to forge alliances and manipulate powerful men. However, Cleopatra was also deeply invested in Egypt and its traditions, and she worked to strengthen her ties with the Egyptian people. She was known for her public work projects, such as the construction of a new harbour at Alexandria and the restoration of ancient temples, which helped to improve the lives of her subjects and reinforce her status as a legitimate Egyptian ruler. A perfume factory? Cleopatra was no stranger to seducing men, and part of that seduction involved she loved them so much that she is said to have built, or at least kept very close tabs on the operation of, a perfume factory. There were two main types of perfumes produced there that archaeologists know of, called Medician and Metopean perfumes. Basically, they were like the Chanel No. 5s of ancient Egypt. After a series of chemical analysis of the substances found at the old perfume factory, scientists have actually been able to figure out what the pharaoh might have smelled like. Apparently, the fancy perfume she doused herself in was a spicy sweet concoction of cinnamon, myrrh and pine resin, among some other things. And it wasn't the light spritz type of perfume we have today. It was thick and lingered for a long time. It's possible that during her reign, Cleopatra might have also commissioned perfumes to be made for her court and for use in religious ceremonies. Alexandria was a center for trade and commerce in the Mediterranean, and it's likely that perfumes from other regions were brought to the city and used by the queen and her court, in addition to the sweet-smelling stuff produced within Egypt. Number 17. Cleopatra's Children The story of Cleopatra can, in part, be told as a kind of motherly saga, 
For a good part of her reign, she was trying to ensure that she had an heir. Through her affairs with Caesar and Antony, she was attempting to consolidate Egypt and Rome to basically create a super empire, the likes of which had never been seen before. She failed, obviously, but it wasn't for lack of trying. When she died, she left behind four offspring that we know of. The first was Caesarion, her kid with Caesar. Cleo tried her best to have little Caesar recognized as Big Caesar's heir, but unfortunately, control of Rome passed to Octavian, Caesar's adopted son, and the man who would ultimately conquer Egypt. When he did conquer Egypt, Caesarion was considered a threat to the throne, and despite Cleopatra's pleas that he would show mercy to her son, Octavian had Caesarion executed. With Mark Antony, Cleopatra had three more children. The first two were twins Alexandra Helios and Cleopatra Selene. There was also a third, Ptolemy Philadelphus, but we don't know so much about him. After Cleopatra administered that fatal asp bite to herself, the rest of her children were perhaps taken to Rome, where they spent the rest of their lives in relative obscurity. Except for Selene. Selene married Juba II, the king of Nubidia, a kingdom in North Africa. The whole thing was set up by Octavian, who wanted a solid ally in North Africa. So Cleopatra's bloodline lived on after all. What else do you want to know about Cleopatra? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more weirdly interesting content.